ketone bodies can also be used as a substrate. But over the years, as more and more people have done research into this, they find, well, okay, uh, these ketone bodies are being used, or there's other properties associated with them. Oh, it's a signaling molecule. It can be used in gene expression. It plays a role in lipid metabolism, in neuronal function, metabolic rate, uh, plays a role in inflammation. Hey there, I wanted to let you know about my latest book, Body Confident, that's coming out in September 2024. Call it a critical thinking guide to your health journey because it is a framework, a guide, a blueprint that's going to help you understand and be able to filter all the information that's out there on the internet that you're getting from social media, YouTube. Go to bodyconfidentbook.com, sign up for updates. The book comes out in September. All right, everybody, thanks for joining me. This is Coach Bronson, and today I have the pleasure of having Dr. Philip Prinz on. Dr. Prinz is a professor at Grove City College. He's a researcher. Um, I looked up your name on ResearchGate. I think you have at least 36, probably more studies that you've put out over the years. So very prolific in the research and the, the publications. You've worked with some other big names in the space, uh, Professor Noakes, Tom, uh, man, my, Dom D'Agostino. I always call him Tom D'Agostino. I'm like, where did that come from? <laughs> And you specialize in low carb ketogenic diets uh, for performance, but then I really liked in your your profile that you mentioned you know your performance base, but also lifestyle. There's an aspect of all of this stuff that goes into helping people live better lives. So could you just give us a little? I just did a little intro, but just introduce yourself a little bit. If there's anything you want people to know about you before we get started, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Coach Bronson, for having me on your uh, show. Really appreciate it. Uh, I mean, yes, most of most of my research focuses on the impact of low carbohydrate diets and ketogenic diets, uh, primarily on on sports performance and also metabolism. That's a big uh, factor as well. And then uh, another um, you know area of specialization and, and interest is also uh, cardiometabolic metabolic uh, health um, as well. I'm uh, originally all the way from uh, Cape Town, South Africa. I was born and raised there. Um, and then uh, came over to the States uh, way back in uh, about 20 years ago in 2005 on a tennis scholarship um, to Georgia Southern University, played, uh, uh, played tennis there. Um, and then I uh, got my uh, bachelor's in exercise science, minored in nutrition, got my master's in kinesiology from that same institution. And then I went on um, to get my PhD in exercise physiology at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and after I finished that up, I um, I ended up here at uh, at Grove City College, where uh, you know a private uh, Christian uh, institution here in uh, Western Pennsylvania. And um, yeah, I'm a, uh, you know chair of the department here, um, you know, professor within exercise science. And yeah, for the last you know decade, I've been here. And and like I just mentioned, that's that's kind of primarily been the focus uh, of our research here with within our lab. But as you also mentioned in your introduction, we have great collaboration. So it's 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 fantastic to work with uh, individuals like Professor, you know, Tim Noakes or Jeff Volek or uh, Dom Diego Stino or um, uh, Andrew Kutnick. And uh, and so, yeah, so that's been a uh, uh, a great so none of none of this uh, work and research that we'll talk about in a little bit would have, would not be possible right with with that collaborative without that collaborative effort absolutely mm -hmm. oh, that's awesome one of the things that uh, I want to set the, as a groundwork for this discussion because a lot of the people that I talk to clients people I meet on social media go to conferences those types of things everybody is and and here's and this is the other piece of this so much of the health and fitness community the information that's out there is being put out there by PhDs and researchers who are building brands around specific mechanisms or areas within the science, scientific data um, to try to establish their niche. And this is the big thing, right? There's 18 million magic pills, 18 million. This is the one thing you need to do to increase longevity or whatever. Sure. So I want to get your, as an expert, um, one of the leading experts in this field, what is your take on some of the things to watch out for or possible pitfalls of using science as a determinant in making lifestyle choices? Yeah, great question. So I think for um, I think it's more to, important to understand for the you know for the person who's not directly right involved within academia um, and and research to understand with within this space right of of, of academia and people are doing you know research constantly. 
and 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 publishing their work. Uh, for the most part, um, you know, people people are publishing for other individuals, right? For other individuals within the field, right? So, oh, here I just did this work, and I publish it in this journal, and it's for other individuals within this that specific niche field and area um, to read. And, and, and you can you can. You can hopefully understand what I'm saying because when you read a lot of these articles, it's very difficult <laughs> to read and and decipher. Some, you know, hopefully most of our papers we have produced is hopefully not too too complicated, and you can walk away with practical application. But there is an enormous amount of of stuff that gets published, even just within this field, where you read the paper and you're like, you walk away like, whoa, what happened there? I can't even understand what's what's <laughs> what's going on, right? So there's 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 that that makes it very difficult for the general public to to understand and like I said to walk away with any kind of you know uh, practical or lifestyle applications right. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition, um, there's 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 stuff that gets published. There's papers gets published on a daily basis. I mean, just within the exercise science and sports nutrition space. I mean, there's there's so many journals. Some are really good. Some are okay. Some are not so okay. There's different impact factors, or some have impact factors. Some don't have impact factors, which kind of represent the quality of the journal. Uh, but there's so much stuff that gets published on a daily basis. Some really good, and some well, a lot of it is just a whole sometimes a whole bunch of nonsense. Uh, to you know, to be quite honest with you, especially within the nutrition space, it's, <laughs> it's a bunch of nonsense that gets published there. If you go, that's a separate topic, right? The field of you know epidemiology and a lot of this observational research, which mm -hmm. confuses a lot of people right one study comes out saying oh this um you know eggs are bad and then steak is bad or this is good and this is bad one you know it's like it's yeah. so confusing for a lot for a lot of people and makes them i definitely makes them skeptical like you know what's wrong with these you know scientist people why can't they get their uh, why can't they get their story straight mm -hmm. so i think it's ultimately it's in, ultimately it's it's important for you know just the general public and the average person interested in who's invest who wants to invest in their own health but use a science-based approach to kind of educate themselves i think how to go about you know this particular process um, i mean if you can take a course that's great or just you know uh, maybe maybe even read online like how how to go about this particular process meaning how how can i go and find an article um, that interests me you know, what, what databases and things to search in once I mm -hmm. find an article, you know, how, how do I read it, right? right? From the from the standpoint of, right, which is from most people's standpoint is what, what can I take away from this at the end of the day, right? If I go through, you know, the introduction and and uh, the methodology and the, all the statistics and the results and the discussion, the conclusion, right? What what is the quick takeaway? And that's that's actually a skill, right? So you're going to have to do that a couple of times to the point where you can read an article and then, uh, you know, a walk away with um, what what is what is valuable and how that how that information can ultimately impact, for example, your health or performance. Right now, how do how do we take that when uh, there's a lot of influencers from the scientific community or academic community who are filling the role because we know a lot of people don't want to don't whether they don't want to or just don't realize that they need to take that that process under their own control and a lot of people give that interpretation and that application of information to to somebody else to give ownership to that to someone else so dr so and so is now my person whatever they say is their interpretation of this study is what I'm going to do. How do we take that, right, and look at, okay, there's the scientific method, which includes evidence base, right? There's, there's, a, there's an ask, this whole debate between science base and evidence base, I don't understand because to me, they're part of the same thing, right? If I'm, if there's the science that's being done in a lab somewhere that provides information as input to my life, then I can experiment with that and what is the evidence that i see in my results mm -hmm. and the, the, what's the merging of those two how do people look at information that they're being told by experts that may or may not apply to their lives how do, how do they evaluate what they should or should not be listening to yeah i mean again another great point because obviously we live in the age of social media 
right? Mm-hmm. And um, you know, I mean, there's there's obviously a ton of people, whether it's you know Twitter or X or Instagram, etc. And as you mentioned, there's a lot of you know influencers, and 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 absolutely, that's <laughs> obviously the vast majority of people are are, are rather going to get their information from that particular mechanism compared to the first mechanism that I talked about, right? Actually actually going and you know finding and finding the article and, and reading it and critiquing it and evaluating it and then and again that's both is both is fine um i would just say um you know, always be skeptical right always always be skeptical and you know don't whether it's whether i'm saying something or you're saying something or whoever is saying something right always always be skeptical you know always uh, always ask questions right I think that's that's the best approach, you know, to to have, right? Because, uh, you know, the other thing to consider, though, for that particular person that you're following and you're getting the information from, you know, we all have our own biases as well, right? We absolutely, I've, you know, we're all we're all biased to some extent, and so you have to consider that, and what is influencing that person's bias, right? Sometimes, especially in this particular field, right, it's conflicts of interest. So, where's the person getting their funding from? Um, or maybe, um, uh, you know, that person's involved in a particular, you know, company or product, you know, as well. And so obviously you can see if there's conflict of interest like that, obviously there's clear biases. And then mm-hmm. and then you, so the person's viewpoints, right, and what they're expressing on social media is influenced by that. So that just, that's just something to, uh, to understand. But I think, again, all... Uh, being skeptical and not being afraid to, you know, um, to ask the right questions is extremely important. But then going back to my first point of if somebody's, you know, sharing research, right, you can don't always just have to take that for granted, right? You can always go back and um, um, and try to, you know, see where the actual information is, is coming from for yourself. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Yeah, the, the bias is a big thing. I like to use the word context because... <laughs> You know, if you have someone whose background, like my background, is more in the the fitness space, so when I'm looking at information or who I'm talking to or what I'm, I'm applying my experience to it, I have a different context than you do or someone who's spent 20 years in clinical um, mm-hmm. family medicine, right? There's a family medicine doctor is going to look at things completely different than I am. So yeah. we can talk about the same thing, but we're going to have different different perceptions and and how we do it. So, okay, and then that also goes for the person. You know, the person we're talking to, the person listening to the information may have a different context. I mean, there's mil- billions of people and everybody's got their own thing going on. So exactly. All right. Let's yeah. get into some of the cool stuff. I just wanted to kind of touch that, go over that because we might, you, you, know, you know, you're a science guy. We might dig into some stuff today, talk about mechanisms and things like that. And I don't want anybody watching this video to kind of say, well, you know, Professor Prin said this about, you know, the ketogenic pathway or this about ketones. And this is how I'm going to now do everything for the rest of my life because whatever, like this is information, filter it, look for context. What is the bias? What is your bias? What are you looking for yeah. um, in, in this kind of information and how do you want to use it? But go out there and play around with it. Don't be afraid to experiment. So, exactly. Um, all right. So let's get into some of the stuff. I got a bunch of questions that I sent you. Let's talk about the first one um, because this is one that uh, I'll just use an example. I actually saw a post on Facebook yesterday where someone had someone made a post that said you have to be in ketosis to lose fat to burn fat and it, just the 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 backwards logic of that statement caught me up caught me by surprise when i first saw it cuz we know that's not true but the idea that these are the types of things that people think the understanding of the difference between what what is it what does it mean to be ketogenic versus what is ketosis, right? Because you can be ketogenic without being in ketosis. And, you know, there's different aspects of that. So if you could get into that a little, and at least that's my understanding, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you have to be in ketosis to be ketogenic. If you could explain what is the difference between ketosis, ketogenic diets, medical, therapeutic ketosis, or, you know, um, ketogenic diets, all all those different things, how they relate and what are the differences? Yeah, I mean, usually- It's a lot. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's a, it's definitely a broad topic, but you know, in short, I mean, your nutritional ketosis is, you know, typically defined as your blood ketone levels is is elevated. So typically, we say, well, okay, your blood ketones are 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 now elevated. So it's in a state of what's termed nutritional ketosis. If it's like around, you know, point five all the way up, you know, to about three three millimolar or something like that. 
uh, again, because usually, you know, if, if you're consuming the standard American diet or even a moderate to high carbohydrate diet and you were to measure your blood ketone levels, which is not that difficult to do, just get a, you know, uh, one of those, you know, blood ketone meters, whether it's Keto Mojo, Precision Extra, whatever. And then you have the little strips, prick your finger, boom, there you go. Um, usually the vast majority of people, because they're consuming the standard American diet, their, your blood ketones is like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, right? Uh, so you, 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 you have some, you know, um, you, you have, keep, uh, uh, you know, these ketone production taking place in the liver, but it's not substantial because, <laughs> because of your diet, basically. Uh, however, if you decide to dramatically change your diet, and especially um, when you, I mean, there's different ways to get into, obviously, you know, ketosis. I mean, you can just not eat for a long period of time. You can exercise for a very long period of time, right? Or you can just severely restrict your dietary carbohydrate intake. And yes, in those uh, uh, three different scenarios, then you can measure blood ketone levels and then you will see it's elevated, right? Because in those different scenarios, you know, your, your blood insulin concentration is going down. Um, and therefore, as a result, you see increases in, uh, in fat oxidation. Those two are very tightly linked. Mm -hmm. I mean, your blood, your blood ins insulin concentration goes up, doesn't. And, and it's very interesting. It doesn't have to go up by that much to significantly hinder and, and inhibit uh, fat oxidation. But if I now uh, decrease uh, my uh, blood insulin concentrations, then I see now some more significant increases in fat oxidation. And with that, again, this is happening in, in, in uh, the hepatic mitochondrial uh, cells where, um, so now you have more fat oxidation, you have more beta oxidation, and you have... Um, uh, a, a byproduct of that is you know, acetyl-CoA, which then gets produced, and then you have acetoacetate that comes from that, that, that then gets converted to beta-hydroxybutyrate, uh, and then gets exported to extrahepatic uh, tissues then from the liver, and that's the main uh, ketone body then, then that you measure, right, is beta-hydroxybutyrate. Mm -hmm. um, and that that's then exported to um, extrahepatic tissues, right, can be utilized by the brain, by the heart, by the uh, by the muscle for energetic purposes. Ever, um, it's it's not you know, whether it's you know beta hydroxybutyrate or acetoacetate. I mean, these ketone bodies is not just utilized as a substrate. Absolutely, right. I mean, because you have you have different substrates. Substrates are just fuel sources from which your body makes energy, right? So it's not just carbs and fats, and but mm -hmm. it's also you know ketone bodies can also be used as a substrate. But over the years, as more and more people have done you know uh, research um, into this, they find well, okay, uh, these ketone bodies are being used. Well, there's other properties associated with them. Oh, it's a signaling molecule. Uh, it can be used in gene expression. It plays a role in lipid metabolism, uh, in neuronal function, metabolic rate, uh, plays a role in inflammation. Absolutely. So there's there's these other properties. It's kind of similar to if, if people are familiar with the story with, with lactate, right? Originally, it was mm -hmm. uh, lactate, ooh, bad guy, fatigue, uh, muscle soreness, and, you know, <laughs> as especially in the field of exercise science, right? It's a bo it's kind right. of boogeyman. And then as more research got done, like, oh no, well, hang on, lactate is an important fuel. It's an important substrate. Uh, it's an important gluconeogenic precursor and a bunch of other uh, important things. So kind of similarities there between those two. So that's, that's so there's definitely absolutely um, many different um, positive uh, health implications associated with being in a state of you know ketosis other than just, it's a kind of a signal of well, I'm 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 using utilizing more more fat for fuel, and then obviously the other part of that question, right? So that's nutritional ketosis, kind of in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. And then you have ketogenic diet. I mean, the uh, keto ketogenic diets, right? Well, there's your low carb diet and ketogenic diet. I mean, it's it's um, you know not technically the same thing. I mean, if you were to look at kind of definitions of here's my standard high carb diet versus moderate carb diet versus low carb diet versus very low carbohydrate i.e ketogenic diet right there's, there's differences so usually a high carbohydrate diet is if the carbohydrate is greater than about 45 percent of your total calories mm -hmm. um moderate carb diet and then you obviously with high carb diet you can think kind of the usual right usda recommendations and and, and all that stuff a moderate carb diet think more like mediterranean diet so carb contact usually between about 26 and uh, 45 and then low carb usually s starts at less than 26 percent uh, in terms of carbohydrate content or less than 130 grams per day but then obviously a ketogenic diet 
which is a very low carbohydrate diet that usually starts at 50 grams or you know or or less per day and obviously the uh, the main point behind that is now i'm severely restricting my my carbohydrate intake and uh, of all those different dietary approaches that i just mentioned right that one is going to result in more significant more pronounced um, you know, uh, you know, ketone uh, formation and, and and ketogenesis, and just to and then last point there. I mean, ketogenic diets. I mean, there's, it's got a long history, right? Long history, right? It's not like, um, you know, you know, you know, somebody that if you go to a low carb conference, right? Oh, it's one of those guys developed a ketogenic, you know, no, diet. Right, yeah. <laughs> or Robert Atkins, right? Um, what was that nineteen? 80s or 70s 70s yeah, 70s yeah when he came out with his book right he developed a keto you know ketogenic or low carb diet now it's got a long history and even just from a medical standpoint right whether it uh, you know first it was you know epilepsy but now you go look especially the, the enormous amount of research that has been done on low carb and ketogenic diets over the last you know 20 years I mean, it's, it's, it's immense and it's, it's enormous, right? Mm -hmm. It's whether it's for weight loss purposes, right? As, as you were talking about, or whether it's utilized within, you know, you know, cancer or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or uh, cardiovascular disease or uh, hypertension, diabetes. Um, So most of these kind of, you know, chronic diseases, right, that we're facing, that we're faced with, which is kind of tied into insulin resistance, Uh, you know, ketogenic diets, obviously playing a huge role and helping to, you know, improve those conditions and uh, a yeah, huge, huge amount of research supporting that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, we could do a whole nother video just on the impact, right. From a health perspective, you said something when you were, def- you know, talking about two things at, at one point you were talking about, you know, the benefits or ketones are increased production of fatty acid, oxi- or fatty acid oxidation, and ketone production when carbs are limited. Um, and then you you said it again when you're talking about the percentages of carbs, it's cutting down to carbs. 50, 50 carbs or less on average is kind of where we start talking about a ketogenic diet. The one thing I noticed that you didn't say is that there's a requirement to increase a crap ton of fat in your diet in order to become ketogenic. So obviously I think there's a there's a trade-off. If I'm cutting my carbs really low, my fat's going to increase naturally, but that's not, am I understanding that correctly? It's not a, a need to increase fat intake isn't part of the definition of a ketogenic diet. Yeah, I mean, if, if you look at kind of the more clinical definition, you know, from a macronutrient perspective, and um, I mean, uh, you know, carbohydrates is, like we said, making up, you know, 50 grams or less, or from a percentage standpoint, you know, 10, you know, less than 10%. But yeah, you know, sure, uh, then fat is, is, is going up. I mean, usually that recommendation is about, you know, 70, 80%, you know, fat. Mm-hmm. Um, with protein making up about 15, you know, 20%. So if you, you know, a lot of articles that you read in kind of the, you know, definition from a macronutrient standpoint, yeah, that's, that's kind of what you see. Usually in the studies that, that we have done, we don't go up with the fat intake um, that high. Usually in our studies, the protein intake um, is, is, is a little bit higher and the fat intake is a little bit lower. I mean, the carb intake, the carbohydrate intake is still, you know, less than, 10%. Mm-hmm. I mean, usually it hovers from a gram standpoint about, f- you know, between 40 and 50 grams per day. Right. But yeah, usually the fat intake in, in, in our studies um, is usually around 60%, you know, 60, 65%. Mm-hmm. And, you know, protein intake, you know, can vary from about 20 to, to 30%. So our, what, what, what we've done in our studies, which is not these metabolic ward studies where people are feeding it, but we provide coaching and counseling, right? And then people are going out there and, con, you know, consuming the foods, but obviously making sure that they're, you know, dramatically limiting their, their carbohydrate intake. And yes, their, their, their blood ketone levels are, are still being elevated. You know, usually on average is about 0.5 millimolar. However, these individuals are also highly physically active. So the, the thought process with that is uh, the reason why their blood ketones might be on the lower side, right? It's because it's being utilized again for, for a substrate. So therefore the blood levels are, are, are lower, but maybe a little bit different macros, for example, that you might see in like a weight loss study or something like that, where yeah. um, their, 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 their fat intake might be higher and their protein intake might be lower compared to what we're doing. Yeah. And I just wanted to call that out because I think in the definition of, or the, the, the general population, I think the understanding of what a ketogenic diet is, is more 
I guess, mentioned or discussed in the context of low carb, capital, bolded, high fat diet, right? Yeah, that's and that's, that's so, and that's the that's difference. An important point. It should yeah, be so, capital. Low, it should be capital bolded, yeah. low carb, and then the high fat is a yeah. And I get thing, and right? I get that from from students as well, right? So and sometimes just our our own students are are, are confused because you know obviously we you know as teaching within the the department and also teach a couple of nutrition courses you know like you exactly what you what you're saying again excellent point you know high they they focus on the high fat and not so much on the low <laughs> low carb right. right so if you if you do that you can make a mistake right so i'm eating you know like i said maybe it's 60 70 80 percent of my calories is coming from fat but i'm not so i'm eating a high fat diet great but i'm not um, I, I, I really, I'm not paying attention that much to my carbohydrate intake in the diet. So my carbohydrate intake might still be on the higher side. Maybe it's, mm. you know, maybe it's around 200, you know, or more grams per day. Right. And then, <laughs> then, then, you, then you're probably gaining weight. Right. Cause again, right. it's, cause again, it's, it's the carbohydrate intake. That's, that's the, that's the big thing that is playing a role, obviously in the context of ketogenesis or just helping obviously in the context of, uh, off weight loss, as I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. that's the big role, right? How much carbohydrates you're consuming in the diet is having a big impact on insulin, which is uh, having a big impact on lipolysis and fat oxidation. And that's the big, you just said, it, you, you went right where I was going to go with the lipolysis. It's particularly for people who have higher body fat percentage who are using the ketogenic diet to lose fat. If you're, even if you keep your carbs low, if you're focusing on the high fat intake, you're kind of making that process harder for your body, right? I'm eating all this fat. Then you, if you're going to take this fat in, you can still overeat fat. Yeah. And I don't think people understand that. And this is one place I want to go. There's two big things that I've been seeing talked about more over the past two or three years. And that is, we'll talk, I'll talk about the first one. Then I'll bring up the second one. The idea that People think if they're keeping their insulin low, that they can't gain fat. And I'm trying to, you know, Dr. Bickman is out there telling everybody, oh, you know, it's the insulin model. You can't, uh, you know, you, insulin has to be present in order for you to, to gain fat. I think, and I, he's absolutely right. And, but I think people are misunderstanding and misinterpreting that as saying, well, if I'm in ketosis all the time and my insulin is always low, you know, I've seen, I've seen people say in, in posts and in conversations, well, I'm trying to get rid of insulin. I'm like, guys, you can't get rid of insulin. You have, you you would die if you didn't have insulin in your system. So there is no, you know, it is possible. There's always going to be insulin present. So just because you're eating a ketogenic diet doesn't mean you can't gain weight. Yeah, I mean, I, I, and so just a, a quick caveat: I'm not, um, um, you know, do, it was Dr. David, you know, um, Ludwig, right? He does a huge amount of work on that. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, you know, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not an obesity expert or or researcher. But I mean, what you're discussing there, some of that goes to the these different models and theories that people have, right, for weight gain or weight loss. And the one that you're describing, right, is the uh, commonly being referred to as the carbohydrate insulin model, right, um, yep. that, you know, Dr. David Ludwig and his team has done, you know, a, a, a good amount and, and, and great, excellent work on. And then the more traditional model, right, that most people are from, familiar with is the uh, Seco, right? Uh, calories in, calories out. So mm -hmm. one model is all about, you know, for the most part about, you know, calories. So my, if my caloric intake, right, exceeds my caloric expenditure, I'm gaining weight. And the other, and the other one, right, is a little bit more hormonal, but particular by right, pointing the finger to, to insulin and again, carbohydrates. So if I consume more carbohydrates, specifically more processed carbohydrate, high glycemic carbohydrate, right, that has a much bigger impact than my blood glucose and therefore insulin, Right. And puts my you know, body, therefore, in storage mode. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm storing more energy. I'm storing more fat. More mm -hmm. energy is being directed to my adipose uh, tissue. Um, and therefore, according to that model of theory, there's less energy uh, available in the blood or the circulation, less fatty acids, less glucose. And the brain then recognizes that. And, and, and then acutely, right, you get that signal of, oh, I'm hungry. I need to I need to eat something. 
right? Or then chronically, right? Uh, according to that model, right? You see, redu you could see reductions in metabolic rate as well. So now, now therefore, as a result of that biochemical mechanisms now i'm not now there's an increase in energy intake or decrease energy expenditure so the two models just flip each other, kind of have things in you know uh you know backwards right so one right. model is the one model the carbohydrate insulin model is saying that um you know the increased energy intake or decreased energy expenditure right which what what we associated with with obesity are just results right it's just outcomes it's not the actual cause and the seco mm -hmm. model says no 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 right that that is the cause right of uh, so it's just a matter of right uh, which uh, which one do you subscribe to right which which do you think right uh, is there more evidence for right because obviously you know there's again this is also obviously a big topic that people you know fight over and when and discuss very vigorously on social media so yeah. Is there in your in the, the studies you've done, the people you work with, do you, I'm, you know, and, and all the data that you've gathered, have you seen people who are following, you know, your prescribed ketogenic diet, how you define it for your studies, who have gained body fat? No, we ha no. So the, the studies that we we have done, because uh, we we um, we have Usually in all, all the studies we've done, there's uh, two interventions. There's the low carb intervention and the high carb mm -hmm. intervention. And um, all the studies that we've done, and we'll uh, probably go over some of them later, uh, the diets are also, um, for the most part, isocaloric. So meaning, sure, they're low carb or high carb, but they're the same. We try to keep the you know calories about the same. And that's mm -hmm. just because, you know, from a research standpoint, you try to control for as many variables as you can, right? Because then somebody's right. going to say, oh, well, if the, 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 this, this, when they were on a high carb diet, they consumed, you know, say 500 kcals per day more than when they were on a low carb diet. And that could explain this factor and that factor. Yeah. So we try to keep it isocaloric and from a body composition standpoint, right? We, uh, you know, these individuals that we bring in is, is, is athletic. They're, they're, you know, uh, they're very lean for the most part. So um, right. you know, they, we don't, so, we don't see any dramatic alterations in, in, uh, from a body composition standpoint, we right. see big metabolic uh, um, adaptations and alteration, but not so much, uh, but not so much body composition. Um, no. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, that, that makes sense, right? You're dealing with athletes. They're doing activity as part of the program, as part of the studies and the tests you're doing, yeah. and you're controlling what they're taking so that it's not like they're focusing on that fat and, and putting and eating, you know, three sticks of butter every day just to, you know, get their ketone <laughs> levels up kind of thing. But, right? uh, but other, but other study on, on athletes, I know there's review articles on that, just specifically looking at, you know, ketogenic diets on, from a athletic population, right, who's not necessarily doing what we're doing and you know equating mm -hmm. calories and whatever, usually do see you know decreases in in in, in body weight, decreases in fat mass, usually uh, with uh, you know preserving lean body mass uh, for mm -hmm. the for the most part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts on people trying to attain high levels of ketosis all of the time? This is another thing that I see. Uh, you know, trying to people, you know, people are stressing out over, I need to be in ketosis 24, seven, 365. I mean, I guess, you know, my, any, any, my, the, well, I, I guess, you know, you know, what is the, what is the specific reason, reason and rationale for, for that? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, is, is it, as I mentioned, you know, earlier about sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of research looking specifically right at these ketone bodies and, how they separately, right, have, you know, different and numerous different uh, health effects. So maybe mm -hmm. there's, cert you know, certain populations who's trying to attain, you know, additional health benefits specifically coming from those ketone bodies, who's just, who's trying to get there, who's trying to maintain a state of, you know, nutritional ketosis. So I understand that. But yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, there's, I mean, even in the work we do, I mean, your, your blood ketone levels, I mean, it, it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's fluctuating and, uh, and sometimes right there's you know the, the 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 guys call me up or email me and oh I'm I'm, I'm oh it's it's not it's, it's not exactly right at you know 0.5 millimolars and I'm trying to get there so hard and uh, it's not it's not the end of the world right because yeah. uh, um, you know even though you might not be you know seeing the desired number 
right? There's still metabolic adaptations absolutely taking place. And, and, and you, you can see it when you bring the person into the lab and we, we have other equipment in, in the lab because there's different ways to see, okay, well, right, you're, 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 you're becoming fat adapted and keto adapted and using more fat for fuel because a lot of studies we are doing, we're trying to maximize the person's ability to utilize more fat for fuel. And so you can hook the person up to a metabolic cart. So you have the mask on and, and it measures uh, respiratory gases from, you know, from which um, rates of you know, fat oxidation can be measured. So even though, oh, look, the person's blood ketone levels is not, for example, you know, um, one millimolar or two millimolar or something like <laughs> something like that, maybe something that they are trying to achieve. Uh, you know, clearly the person still um, has metabolically adapted and, you know, to the diet and their the rate of fat oxidation is, you know, double or triple uh, what it used to be on their traditional diet. Right, right. What is the what should shoot people really be shooting for? Because this is part of that discussion is, you know, I've talked to people who are trying to be in three between that three and five all the time. And my conversation that I tell people all the time, like you said earlier, is look, once you're adapted, and once your body gets good at, produ at, at producing, and then there's a second piece no one talks about is utilizing. So yeah, when you first get adapted, maybe you get into the twos and threes. Sure. Yeah. But at, over time, I would love to see you under one because now I know you're using it. Sure. You know, um, is that kind of what you, you know, I, I, I try to you know, like, hey guys, you know, you're always stressing out, like you said, stressing out over trying to be in the, in a three or I, people like, I, I'm, I, I can't stay at five. I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm like, you're not doing anything. That's what's wrong with you. Go exercise. <laughs> you know that's that's the thing right yeah i mean the other the other thing is right how do you how, you know how, just you know, how do you feel right mm -hmm. i mean do you um do you, do you even notice any physiological right you know differences you know when your blood ketones was you know elevated as you were saying to much higher levels three four five maybe two you know at the at the beginning stages uh, of the uh, of the diet or the experiment uh, compared to now later on a couple months later where it's maybe hovering somewhere between 0.5 and 1. So and again this, 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 all the studies that we've done on, on, on athletes it's um, you know it's it's for the most part the blood ketone levels is hovering around you know 0.5 millimolars it's it's, mm -hmm. it's it's not high um, significantly elevated um, at all. Um, but, um, but like I said, uh, you know, clearly uh, significant metabolic adaptations is, is taking place. And again, going back to, again, I mentioned it earlier, you mentioned it now, you know, as well, I mean, utilization, right? So, I mean, these, right. these, those you know, ketone bodies, again, the main one that you're measuring in the blood, right, is, is, is beta hydroxybutyrate. I mean, there's other, the, the breath ones, that's acetoacetone, uh, um, you know, acetone and, um, but if it's the most, uh, ones that people are using with the finger pricks, if, if it's low, well, it's probably being utilized, right, by different um, different tissues. Like I said, the brain, the heart, uh, skeletal muscles. So there you go. Yeah, I don't, like to tell people. Yeah. Like don't, tell don't, people don't focus. You can't just use one biomarker and say, I'm going to get obsessed about this particular one. Yeah. Yeah. Ab oh, my gosh. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, I like to tell people, like, if you're if you're keeping your carbs low consistently and you're doing that without fail, then what are you even testing for? Right. How do you feel? Are you getting the results that you want to get? It's, you know, if you're if I go to the to the gas station and I put 98 octane in my car, I don't need to test my exhaust every 10 miles to see if 90, 93, 98 is being burned. Right. Yeah. That's all I'm putting in my car. That's all my car has to use. So that's kind of. And, and the other thing, though, to last point I'll say with this is, um, you know, could. And it's probably also a factor in our studies. Um, sometimes when people do low carb or, you know, or try to go, you know, keto, they, they also want to, instead of being so low on the protein side of things, you know, like 15, 20% is, is, you know, kind of low. And mm -hmm. they rather want to bump up their protein intake, which I think, especially from a weight loss standpoint, is, is much smarter, right? Rather, rather you know, decrease the, the fat intake, try to increase the protein intake a little bit more. Uh, and I think, and I think that's a better strategy, you know, for, uh, for a lot of, pe you know, for a lot of people, but that increased protein intake might also result in, uh, less, you know, ketone body formation. So just, a just a mm -hmm. side point, uh, you know, side point there, but yeah, definitely the benefits of going from, you know, consuming like 0.8 or one gram per kilogram body weight of protein to upping it or doubling it to more like get closer to like two grams per kilogram body weight. Um, I think for most people that's probably going to be more, more beneficial. Absolutely. I'm so glad you said that. That's awesome. 
we are very aligned because that's pretty much what I tell people too. Good. All right, let's get into some of the, the fun stuff. Uh, the question of the decade, all right, do athletes need carbohydrates to exercise? Now, I'm going to caveat that and add to this, not just because there's been so much work done on the endurance side. What about strength athletes? What about um, soccer athletes, CrossFit athletes? There's so many different modalities and and demands on the body from the traditional metabolic pathways and how we exercise. So across just a general, is it, you know, cause I've had people, Oh, well all the, you know, it's been shown that, you know, athletes that endurance athletes can be okay, but I'm a power lifter. I still need my carbs. Okay. So, um, most of, so based on the work that, that we've done over the last, you know, almost close to a decade which has so i can just you know you know quickly go through the you know, different um kind of main outcomes that we've assessed uh, for example five kilometer so it, most of it is running and uh cycling just just a quick caveat there um but yeah we've looked at high intensity short duration endurance exercise performance we've done uh, for example graded exercise testing vo2 max testing five kilometer time trial performance uh, one mile uh running time trial performance uh hit protocols right so high intensity interval training 800 you know uh, specific like 800 meter sprints and then sure and then your more endurance exercise performance as well that's just the stuff that that we have done so we're going from a couple of minutes to a couple of hours. And uh, we have seen kind of just, you know, uh, you know, kind of in a very, you know, abbreviated format, we've seen uh, no differences. So all those studies, um, we've compared low carb to high carbohydrate diet. Also, uh, the, we utilize crossover investigations. Crossover investigations is when each person undergoes both interventions. So just just an important point to mention. Yeah, and, 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 and all of those studies, the performance is equivocal, right? So no significant difference between the two diets or, or low carb diet is not impairing performance or flip that uh, conclusion around. The high carbohydrate diet is not necessarily improving performance above the low carbohydrate uh, diet. But then um, there are some review articles. Um, if you're interested in that, you can look into, I mean, uh, there was a review article, I think it was in 2019, so about you know four or five years ago by uh, McSwinney and colleagues, looked at about 13 randomized control trials. And then um, uh, 2021, uh, Murphy and colleagues, another review article uh, on, about, I think it was about 17 studies. And Professor Tim Noakes, he also published a review article, was it last year or year before? So again, there's been a couple of review articles. So now looking across the performance spectrum, right? So not just running and cycling, but people have to understand, unfortunately, most of these studies are done running, <laughs> running and cycling. But yeah, for example, if you go not that far from us, our, our uh, good good friends and collaborators, uh, Jeff Olek at the Ohio State University. So their their lab, they have looked at what, what, what you're interested in at, you know, resistance training and strength performance. And so sure, when you look at these meta-analysis, they're looking at all these performance outcomes, right? All these performance outcomes, right? Endurance, strength, and power. And so now we have, you know, close to 30, if not a little bit more than 30 uh, randomized controlled trials, looking at low carb diet or comparing those low carb diets to high carbohydrate diets across the performance spectrum. And it's saying what it's, it's null findings, right? So the, uh, we're seeing uh, chronic adaptations uh, to low carbohydrate diet produces similar results compared to a high mm -hmm. carbohydrate diet. Mm -hmm. So that, so that, I guess, obviously there's a lot more to unpack there, but um, sure. that, that's such an important point to, to mention because no, no athlete, <clears throat> you don't have to be elite or professional, right? A lot of us just do stuff recreationally, right? And obviously other people are more competitive, but no, no person wants to, you know, uh, impair their performance. And there's still, there's still so many individuals out there who don't want to switch because they don't, mm -hmm. right? It, it's been so ingrained, right? Because that's the message, right? They have to do high carb. You have to do high carb. And right. so they, they, they don't want to switch to low carb because, you know, this belief that whether it's endurance or high, especially high intensity or by strength and power, right? All that's going to be impacted. So, but the, the science would suggest otherwise. Yeah. What is, if, if the results in performance are basically the same, then what is the draw for an athlete to say, Hey, I'm going to go ahead and get fat adapted and keto adapted. Yeah, absolutely. So if, if, um, I would say, especially, well, obviously different, 
reasons here. Um, but let's say you're you're an athlete and maybe you're you're you're, you're struggling with 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 your weight, right? Because obviously there's definitely and, and and we see this right, and especially with individuals who are recreationally active, uh, but they they are you know overweight, right? So they they they're exercising right uh, quite a large amount, um, but they have trouble controlling their body weight. Meaning the person is insulin resistant. So I'd say any any athlete that's really on that insulin resistant side of the spectrum, right? Because there's different ways to determine if you're insulin resistant. And if 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 you are uh, you, if you're in that boat of oh my gosh, I have to exercise, you know, hours per day to help to control my body weight. You know, guess what? Your diet's wrong. And um, so that's that's a great example for that individual to switch over from their you know traditional you know standard American diet or high carb and you know tr- uh, switch over to low carb diet to decrease body weight and it just helped to improve body composition. Now other I- individuals, right? Uh, maybe you're not in that boat, but okay. What what some other benefits? Uh, increased fat oxidation, right? So um um in- well increased fat oxidation, decreased carbohydrate oxidation. And that's, you know, maybe something else we can, you know, talk about as well. But, you know, we're, we have, we've, we published a study, was it last year? Showing the, we published on the highest rates of fat oxidation ever recorded, ever in the scientific literature. So absolutely, you can, you can go from, you know, um, I mean, typically most, most athletes, if you look at their peak rate of fat oxidation, maybe you can get it up to maybe like 0. 0.5, 0. 0.6 grams per minute. Um, you know, but <laughs> that's, that's on their traditional diet. If you then s- switch that person over, you look, you look at all the, our, our studies, like I said, it's crossover. So we take that same person, right? Here's your rate of fat oxidation on the high carb diet. And then they go on a low carb diet, doubling, tripling, in some cases, even more of their rate of, uh, uh, of fat oxidation, just being able to utilize more fat for fuel during exercise. And as we have shown, very importantly, even at those high exercise intensities, according to right, the, th- these traditional beliefs, right, crossover concept, et cetera, oh, I can mm-hmm. only burn uh, greater amounts of fat at these low exercise intensities. But once I get to the high exercise intensities, right, it's not possible. Baloney, right, we have shown that the so-called carbohydrate dependence of high intensity exercise is an artifact of the habitual diet. So you right. switch over, right, and now you're using a lot of fat for fuel even at these high exercise intensities. And again, that also um, has a glycogen. Whenever you're using more fat for fuel, right, it has a glycogen sparing effect. So you're tapping in less to your to your, uh, your muscle glycogen stores. And the other mm-hmm. important point also, it, 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 it it's also going to help um, promote more normal blood glucose levels, more, you know, euglycemia, right, um, which we got a great paper coming out. Hopefully by the end of this year, well, two big ones that we will argue um, that, you know, th- this whole hitting the wall phenomenon, obviously this is more now related to um, endurance sports. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, within the field of endurance you know, activities, right? So we say, well, the hitting the wall, right? That point during uh, the exercise where it's like, boom, I hit that wall or bonking, whatever you want to call it, right? I can't go any further or just that, that feeling of fatigue, right. That, 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 that comes upon and you want to slow down or stop the traditional model, right. is because your muscle glycogen stores have run out. We're saying hitting the, that hitting the wall phenomenon is more closely related to uh, what's known as exercise induced hypoglycemia. So when your blood glucose start to right. Yep. And, and basically the, obviously your brain picks this, picks that up. And in order to basically, uh, you know, stop the development of glycopenic brain damage, right? It, it, it therefore slows you down, right? Is this a uh, follow up on the papers that Doctor no- Professor Noakes has published on the the uh, central? What is it? The uh, central governor central, model. Central, yeah. yeah, central governor model. Yeah, yeah, so, it yeah. definitely it definitely fits in there. But um, we again, we I don't want to spend don't want to say too much on this because this stuff is going to come out. Yeah. I think it's going to be epic and very iconic. Um, and he's done a you know, Professor Noakes, I mean, he just spent the last couple of years reviewing like 100 studies on mm-hmm. this. You can find evidence for this all the way back to the 1930s when 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 the original thought was that, you know, hitting the wall, right, is more to do with exercise-induced hypoglycemia. Uh, and, and that has big implications. So if we're saying, um, if we're saying, you know, fatigue during endurance exercise, right, it's, yeah. it's more to do with um with hypoglycemia compared to you know uh, your your glycogen the stores. actual lack of great because because that because that can happen regardless of how much you have right i mean you could have plenty of glycogen in your body and still hit that wall 
Exactly, right? But yeah. we're saying in the field of sports nutrition, you got to load up on carbs, right? You got to load exactly, up on carbs exactly. to, to, to top off your glycogen stores. Yeah. Right? And for anybody that's not familiar with the central governor theory, um, if you're if you look it up, just look just type that in and there's a bunch of stuff that will come up. Um, but also, you know, for anybody who's in the exercise science space, if you haven't, basically I like to equate it to it's like the Golgi tendon, right? It's it's your body's it, it's an autogenic inhibition. Mm -hmm. that your brain is saying, Hey, we need to slow down. Cause this is mm -hmm. something's being stretched further than it needs to be stretched. Yeah. Yeah, Kinda. exactly. Right. So you, you, I mean, your brain is in control, right? It's monitoring input from internal, external environment. And obviously it's receiving those signals and, you know, it's trying to prevent a catastrophic outcome, right? right. So it's creating right. this sensation of fatigue or reducing motor unit recruitment. And so therefore, as a result, you want to, you know, slow down or stop mm -hmm. as a result. But going back to your original question, that's another reason, right? So just, low carb diets helping to maintain more euglycemia, um, you know, especially also during exercise. Um, so that's, that could be a, a big factor if you, uh, especially if you, you know, see the research that's going to come out uh, from our lab um, very soon here. And then the other thing uh, that kind of ties into that maybe to some extent is also metabolic health, right? So if you're, if you're, if you're an athlete, but again, you're on that insulin resistance side of the spectrum, or you see, mm -hmm. you're seeing impairments in your cardiometabolic health. Um, then absolutely, then this is this is another reason to switch over. And again, we did not, we did a um, one of the studies we published last year. Uh, we showed again these individuals who are highly physically active. I mean, also most of them were you know running marathons, triathlons, and and we did uh, in that study we did CGM, so continuous glucose monitoring, and based on you know, and that study was uh, 31 days, so basically a month. When mm -hmm. they were on a high carb diet, 30% of our sample, so 30% of our sample met this, you know, pre-diabetic glycemic phenotype. So their blood glucose, their mean blood glucose, their median blood glucose, their fasting blood glucose was so significantly elevated above 100 milligrams per deciliter, right? Because that fits that uh, pre-diabetic uh, glycemic phenotype. 30% of that sample, right, was was uh, met that particular uh, definition uh, of being pre-diabetic. I think that's that's pretty significant, right? I mean, uh, that those are middle-age um, athletes in a middle-age cohort, but this means that a low carbohydrate diet can therefore also be utilized as a therapeutic strategy, right, to help improve blood glucose levels and help to improve metabolic health, mm -hmm. right, in individuals who are obviously at risk of pre-diabetes and diabetes, which we know is a significant segment of the population right because yeah that's the other part of our research that that i feel passionate about right because it's not just oh look here's the general population and what you have i mean you have like 50 percent of the general population is either diabetic or pre-diabetic right or some form of insulin resistance other statistics go up to 80 percent or higher it's, and it's even higher because that's just reported exactly right so you know it's 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 high mm -hmm. but now we're seeing <laughs> we're, we're, we're we're seeing the same phenomenon in athletes now a lot of, not a lot of people have done this so it's, it's hard to say what number but we reported 30 percent. so maybe it's maybe it's a little bit higher maybe it's a little bit lower but absolutely there's a certain percentage of athletes that you need to be aware of uh, of this absolutely right if you're just consuming yeah. that standard american diet and, and that thought process of well i can eat every anything i want to as long as i'm doing all this amount of of uh, of work uh, but the individual's metabolic health unknown to them in some cases is being mm -hmm is being impaired. And again, another great example of switching over yeah. from yeah. Uh, to low carb. Yeah. One of the other things that I've seen in my clients and myself, my own personal journey, you know, when I went, uh, I went from like a paleo lifestyle right into carnivore for my, that's my mm. journey. I overnight, boom, I'm done. No more veggies for me. Um, <laughs> but the biggest thing that I saw within a 90 day period, you know, I owned a CrossFit gym at the time. Um, I was in my mid forties. And I was down to, you know, if I could work out three days in a week, it was a good week for me mm -hmm. because of the recovery time, because of the injuries. My injury rate was astronomical. Um, there were so many things that were hurting or, tor you know, I had men torn meniscus, torn labrums in both shoulders. I was pulling a groin, pulling a hamstring, tearing a calf, like something every couple months, something was happening that was throwing me off my schedule and I couldn't work out. Within 90 days, all of those things just disappeared. Like the mm. the overall just inflammation, my body's ability to heal and repair itself, everything drastically changed. And I went from if you know three days was a good week to I can do I could do seven days a week now if I wanted to. Mm. Um, is that something that anybody's done a study on, or you have you seen as another impact? Because 
for me, that immediately improved my performance because now I could train the way I wanted to train and then I could perform better because of that. So it didn't, the adaptation didn't directly affect my performance, but it affected my ability to train, which then improved. So it indirectly that, that was a benefit. Yeah. I mean, yes, there's, there's studies on that. Um, but in more clinical populations, right? So your clinical mm-hmm. populations get it, the ketogenic diet. So we know that, you know, low carb ketogenic diet is, you know, has powerful anti-inflammatory mechanisms. Absolutely. And that's, you know, obviously, you know, uh, probably a big part of what you see in your own personal experience there. Mm-hmm. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, there's, there's not a lot of that in the stuff that, you know, that, that we've done. Um, and well, not, not, not just, sorry, not just that we've done, but in this space of looking yeah. at whether it's low carb or any kind of diet, right. And, and, um, and kind of specifically what you're touching on, because a lot of these studies, as I described earlier, I mean, it's looking at performance, mm-hmm. right. It's looking at different markers of performance, but what should also be done is what's happening with training, right? How is training impacted by high carb or specifically in this case, low carb diets? Yep. Uh, wh- what is injury risk, right? And that's, that's a huge question. And, and, and I wish more people were interested about this so they can actually you know, study this, right? So while somebody is say low carb for a couple of months or high carb for a couple of months, right? What is the injury risk right during that particular, you know, time frame? But if you're going to, so that, great question. If you're going to try to find actual hardcore, right, uh, you know, scientific evidence for that, specifically in, in athletes, you're not going to find it. And that's the other unfortunate thing about this, about this space. Only recently have people become a little bit more interested in studying, you know, low carb diets and sports performance, right? Because it was mm-hmm. a taboo topic, right? You were not mm-hmm. allowed to talk about it or research it. Good luck getting funding. Right, because obviously you know the you know the high carbohydrate mentality you know in sports in the field of sports nutrition, right? <laughs> so it's only been a more of a recent thing where people have become more interested, and more research is being done uh, within that space. So yeah, now you, I mean, sure, here's some of the stuff that we've done and in, in, you know, in others, but like it's like you have this ginormous you know gap within the literature like so what about yeah. in, what yeah. about injury risk what about training uh what about other sports other than just you know um <laughs> you're running and, and and biking right uh what about you know uh what, what about kind of you know, hand-eye coordination sports you know tennis cricket you know golf you know etc what about also what about you know females pretty much all of these studies are just done in you know males so i mean there's, there's so many there's so many questions and that's a that's a that's a great point that warrants further investigation because as you mentioned there's a lot of anecdotal right a lot of lot of n of one experiments mm-hmm. that's that where people are reporting exactly what you are, are, are saying. So ultimately, I mean, in the lack of scientific evidence, right. I mean, you can always just do these self experiments and see for yourself and more than likely because of those powerful anti-inflammatory effects right off low carbohydrate and ketogenic diets, um, you're going to probably see less inflammation, greater recovery, right. Less injury. So. Yeah. I think that's, you got to add that to your list of studies for next year. So real quick, I know you mentioned it and we can end on this. Could you, you talked about the crossover. Could you explain what that is and why it matters? Why, why do we care about this, this crossover idea? Yeah. So I would just, you know, again, quickly say, you know, for anybody interested, um, you know, if anybody interested in, uh, um, you know, sports performance and sports nutrition, anybody who's ever, you know, been, you know, active in any sporting activity, right. Um, you've probably been told that you have to consume a high carbohydrate diet, right, in order to optimize your sports performance, right? If you, I mean, if you go, I'm sure you've seen it at you know conferences, or even last year I was talking at an NSEA event, and I said, okay, well, raise your hand if you ever told an athlete, or you've ever been told, right, as an athlete, right, that this is the case, high carb, optimized sports performance. Everybody raised their hands, right? But why, right? That's wh- why. And you did so, this at an NSEA conference. <laughs> yes. They didn't kick uh, you out? Wait a second. No, we actually hosted it on, on, on campus, so they couldn't kick me out. Uh, <laughs> now, they're actually very receptive, very receptive. I've, uh, so uh, there's definitely uh, uh, starting to be an interest in, in, that, in this topic, absolutely. But people have to understand, so 
why? What is the historical background, right? So the, you have the crossover concept, and then you have this, what you can call this glycogen-centric view of exercise performance. Um, so those are kind of the two big models that explain the higher carbohydrate mentality within the uh, field of sports nutrition, right? And we talked about glycogen a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. but 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 absolutely, that's, that goes from decades ago. It was the 1960s, the Scandinavians came up with that muscle biopsy technique. Right. And what they did is, 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 is they made people exercise until exhaustion, but they would do this muscle biopsy pre and post. And then they would because mm -hmm. it, it measures your the glycogen content right within the muscle. And they would say, oh, before exercise, the glycogen content is, is very high. And then uh, when they stop, right, it's it's low. And then they started to manipulate people's glycogen content by, by, by feeding them either high or medium or low carb diets and like, look, um, the more carbs in the diet, the higher the pre-exercise muscle glycogen content. Mm -hmm. And the higher the pre-exercise muscle glycogen content, right, it's associated with um, with increased uh, exercise uh, performance or the longer the person's able to exercise. So they would find this positive linear association between pre-exercise muscle glycogen content and uh, endurance exercise uh, performance. But those studies were only a, a couple of days when people would go on those diets. So that's this kind of glycogen centric view of, of exercise um, um, performance, right? So if you go, okay, uh, so all I have to do is just, I'm going to stuff my muscle and lower with as much glycogen as possible. So I just consume as much carbohydrate as possible, right? That's why those sports recommendations, right, are, um, you know, about, you know, anywhere between about six and 12, you know, uh, grams per kilogram of body weight of carbohydrate you have to consume mm -hmm. during exercise. And then you look at how much you're supposed to be consuming, um, uh, sorry, during exercise. I mean, now the recommendation is um, for carbohydrate ingestion during exercise all the way up to 120 grams. Is it per, really? Wow. Uh, yeah, 120 grams per hour during exercise. So it's this wow. huge, huge amount I have to consume before exercise to, right, top off that glycogen fuel tank and then now 120 grams during exercise i mean it's <laughs> it's a lot but as long as people understand well that's 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 a big reason this glycogen centric view of exercise performance and the other one is you mentioned right the, the the question um this crossover concept the crossover concepts anybody who has a, a textbook uh, an exercise science or you know uh, sports nutrition you can go you know flip through it and you'll see the this picture right off the of the crossover concept it's it's not new i mean it's was it first published by george brooks and mercier i think in 1980s but the, the idea that fat is an inferior metabolic fuel unable to support higher intensity exercise goes back actually to the 1920s so it's been around for a while but the the crossover concept just depicts this relationship between the the uh, substrate metabolism particularly carbohydrate and fat metabolism and the exercise intensity. So basically saying the as as I as I increase the exercise intensity, right? I go from low to moderate to high intensity, my rate of fat oxidation is going down and my rate of carbohydrate oxidation is going up. And it's saying that the crossover point where the two lines are intersecting for most individuals is about say 60% VO2 max, obviously there's individual variability there, uh, but it's saying, so it's 60% VO2 max at that intensity, which is obviously moderate intensity, 50% um, of the energy is coming from carbs and 50% of the energy is coming from fat. Then it also means, so below that, below that crossover point, the majority of the energy was coming mostly from, from fat, but above, right? Above that crossover point, the majority of the energy is now coming from carbohydrates. This is what's termed the carbohydrate dependence of high intensity exercise. So now anywhere from 60% uh, all the way up to 100% VO2 max, meaning now as I go from moderate to high intensity exercise, right, the rates of carbo carbohydrate oxidation, right, meaning the percent energy contribution from carbohydrates is, is, is high. I mean, if you go look at that figure and you go, okay, what if I exercise at 80% VO2 max and more higher exercise intensities, then uh, the vast majority of the energy, right, is supposedly right, coming from carbohydrates. Very little uh, is, is coming from fat. And this is such an important point because the cross or <clears throat> concept is used as justification to teach people away from low carb diets, especially for athletes who are performing above that crossover point. And you go, hang on, that's like most athletes. Don't most athletes exercise above 60% of their VO2 max? Well, of course they do. So uh, you know, so whether it's this 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 glycogen centric view or the crossover concept, right? They're both being utilized for for decades now. It's not right. a new thing for decades to to 
to uh, to get athletes right on or tell them this is the only way this is the only approach to optimize your performance right and to teach people away from uh or use as justification right to teach people away from low carb diets but I, uh, our research has shown that that's that's not true um there's another approach okay so we have shown and you can people can go look up our our studies because as we said uh, previously you know some of the uh, stuff is done in high intensity a lot of the stuff we've done is high intensity. Actually, all the stuff we've done is, has been above sixty percent VO two to max. Now that I think about it, it's all all all, all that has been a, all has the way up to the the high the mid to high eighties, right? Yeah, eighty percent, ninety percent. Again, because it's you're looking at you know five five k people are good at running five k's. I mean, you're if you're running able to run a five k between fifteen and twenty minutes. I mean, that's you're booking it, mm -hmm. right? Uh, doing a one mile time trial again, you're you're running fast. Uh, you're running at a you know a very high percentage of your VO two max. Or doing, uh, for example, one study we did six eight hundred meter sprints. So again, eight hundred meter sprints. Again, that's 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 high intensity. So um so ab yeah, so absolutely. So you go look at those studies. But now we put people on low carb diets, and they're using a lot of fat for fuel, even at these high exercise intensities. And yes, we did one study where. We basically reevaluated the crossover concept and redrew, redrew, redrawn it basically. Um, so, what does it look like for low carb athletes? Because we know what it looks like for. Because when you see that picture in the textbook, you have to understand where does the data come from. Well, it comes from you know just you know, your, your standard individuals consuming their standard diet. Yep. Okay. Well, that's what the crossover concept looks like if you consume the standard diet, but it does not look like that when you consume low carb diet. So we, we have shown that that crossover point shifts significantly to the right. Uh, in that publication, we found the crossover point, instead of occurring at like 50, 55, 60% VO2 max, it occurred at 85% VO2 max. So meaning at 85% VO2 max, that's a 50, 50 split between carbs and fat. So only that, and again, that's, that's high, very high exercise intensity. So only once they, only once you go above 85% VO2 max, only then did car, did, uh, did fat oxidation start to go down and carb oxidation started to go up uh, again. So significant. And in that same study, you can go look at the, one of the graphs we have, you go at that intensity at 85% VO2 max because on the low carb it was, it was a 50, 50 split, right? Cause that's the crossover point. So those same people, when they were on a, on a high carb diet, what happened at 85% VO2 max? Is it was it a 50-50 split? No, of course mm -hmm. not. It was it was it was 90% of the energy was coming from carbohydrate. Only 10% of the energy was was coming from was coming from fat. And it's then huge. Yeah, so I mean that's that's you know that just shows you you know um, the impact of the habitual diet and and what how strongly that impacts the metabolic response during exercise. And mm -hmm. then in a in a study after that um, we made. A, a, adapted people to low carb diets have them run these 800 meter sprints and they were doing these 800 meter again if anybody's done an 800 meter sprint before i mean it's 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 tough so they were doing it at about 85 percent of their vo2 max between 85 and 90 percent of their vo2 max and, and and we measured the rates of fat oxidation during these these intervals and guess mm -hmm. what we measured? We measured the highest rates of fat oxidation ever recorded. I mean, the group average was like 1.5, 1.6 grams per minute, but then there was like 30% of the sample uh, who was getting hitting two grams per minute uh, in terms of fat oxidation. That's 120 wow. grams per hour. Uh, wow. Again, that's 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 unheard of. So um, again, this idea that fat is- that's, it, almost, that's almost double what the high, right? The, was, the highest is in the 70s, right? Yeah, I mean, if you go, I mean, you go, there's, you know, even an old study by Stephen Finney, 1980s, your group average there was, I think it was like 90 grams per hour. Was it 90? Okay. But uh, Jeff Volek, also, they did this one study with these ultra endurance guys, again, group average there, you guess same thing as like 1.5 grams per minute. So again, for us, yes, it, it, it definitely appears these highly trained athletes, you know, they can, uh, you know, get their, you know, fat oxidation up to, but, you know, 1.5, 1.6 grams per minute, but there was there was 30 percent of our sample. There was a couple of these guys who were going even above that, wow. and getting up to two <laughs> two grams per minute. So this this again this idea that fat is an inferior metabolic fuel and able to support high intensity exercise is 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 not true. That's awesome! Wow. There you go. So much good information. I really appreciate you being on. I feel like we need to do this again. I've got 18 different topics that we could probably talk about and spend another hour each. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Uh, where can people find you? I know you're at Grove City uh, is where you're a professor at, but uh, you have some social media and some places people can get a hold of you and look at your info. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm not that active on on social. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm I am on what's it, Twitter or X, so you can find me mm -hmm. on there. And sure, well, so sure, I'll when when we do a study or or, or something new comes out, I'll, I'll I'll definitely post it there. ResearchGate, if you're into that, um, you can go on the ResearchGate uh, uh, profile as well. Or absolutely, you can just you know again Google Grow City College, my name, and then you'll find me there. And my contact information, um, if you ever want to just, you know, uh, you know, shoot an email or if you have anybody is, you know, uh, you know, interested, if you're, uh, you know, if whether you, whether you want to attend Gross City College, the exercise science department, there you go. We're coming up with a new master's program in kinesiology starting uh, next year. So if you're interested, because, you know, again, that's especially from a research standpoint, that's that's what we do, what we just discussed. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of people doing this kind of stuff. Uh, and then also, um, if you if you feel passionate about it um, and you want to, you know, uh, a gift to the program or specifically gift to the to the research, um, absolutely as well because again uh, this I would say it it's it's still very difficult to fund these studies right you you're, you can't go to your traditional agencies and uh, and get the money uh, from them uh, so you know so if you want <laughs> if you want to see this kind of work and line of research continue which is there's not a lot of people doing it absolutely mm -hmm. helping fund those kind of uh, research effort, efforts is um, is definitely highly appreciated. Awesome. Thank you very much for being on. I appreciate it. Thank you.